What is up everybody? My name is Jeremy and welcome to the channel. And today we're going to be doing a deep dive into the history, lore, and origins of everyone's favorite northern house, House Stark. From their lineage that can be traced all the way back to the first men, to how they became kings of winter, and how they eventually lost their crown. So strap in everyone because winter is officially here. When the snows fall and the white winds blow, the lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. House Stark is a very ancient house that can trace their origins all the way back to the First Men. And according to legend, House Stark was originally formed by Brandon the Builder, a legendary figure who lived during the Age of Heroes thousands of years ago. He is said to have built both the Wall and Winterfell, the ancient seat of House Stark. But the Wall and Winterfell weren't always the massive structures that we know them to be in our current story. Back during the days of Bran the Builder, Winterfell and the Wall were no more than a tower and a small keep. But one thing that has been there since the very beginning were the Winterfell Crypts, and it seems that even the ancient Starks had a long history of interring their dead in crypts like this. Which is a tradition that has persisted all the way through the years, even till the current story, as we see that all of the previous Kings of Winter and Lords of Winterfell have been buried down in those crypts. But the Castle of Winterfell itself was something that was built on over time, most likely by the following descendants of Bran the Builder that came after him and the following Kings of Winter, until it eventually became the massive castle and structure that we know it to be in the current story, which is similar to the Wall as well. When the Wall was originally first built, it was uh, nowhere near as tall as the 700 plus foot mammoth that we know it to be now. Originally, it was much, much smaller, and we hear that each Lord Commander had raised the Wall a little bit higher than how the previous one had had left it. So similar to Winterfell, the wall was something that was built up over time, over the centuries. According to legend, Bran the Builder enlisted the help of both the giants and the children of the forest in order to raise the wall, and established a Night's Watch to guard it after it was raised. But the wall isn't all just stone and ice. We also hear tale that the wall was originally had spells carved into its foundations. Spells that specifically keep the dead from crossing, and which just is more evidence that the ancient Starks and the ancient Order of the Night's Watch knew something that our current day Starks have forgotten, and that was what the original threat beyond the wall was, the others. The Starks would go on to rule as Kings of Winter for nearly 8,000 years, but it wasn't always so. The ancient Starks gradually defeated rival kings over the years, and they often fought savage wars for dominance against rival kings like the Barrow Kings to the south and the Red Kings to the east. And even in the north, the Starks weren't always the uncontested kings of winter. Their biggest rival came in the form of House Bolton of Dreadfort. The Starks and the Boltons would often fight for dominance and clashed many times over the years. And it wasn't until the invasion of the Andals centuries later that the two decided to put their quarrel aside and defend the north together. Led by King Theon Stark, the North successfully fended off the Andal invasion when King Theon Stark himself defeated Argos Seven Star in the Battle of the Weeping Water. Then, after that, King Theon Stark took it a step further and sought revenge against the Andals, having raised a fleet and sailing all the way to Andalos, putting hundreds of Andal warriors to death. Then, years later, the Starks would attempt to conquer the Three Sisters, which would end up triggering a conflict with the Arons of the Vale, called the War Across the Water, which reportedly lasted a thousand years, until the Arons were eventually victorious over the Starks, and the Arons have ruled over the Three Sisters ever since, even till this day. A lot of House Stark's timeline is still yet unwritten and unaccounted for, having been around for thousands of years and having not all of the history ever been put down. But at one point, centuries later, we do hear a tale of House Manderley being exiled from the Reach by the Gardener King, Peron III. The Starks welcomed the Manderleys to the north with open arms, where they accepted oaths of fealty. And in return, they were gifted the Wolf's Den and its surrounding lands, 
which would eventually become White Harbor, the closest thing that the North has to a big city and its biggest port. As rulers of the North, it often fell to the Starks to assist the Night's Watch whenever wildlings made it past the wall, which they often did. The Starks and the Night's Watch maintained a close relationship for centuries, with House Stark assisting the Night's Watch whenever they needed help. Which brings us to our most legendary tale in the history of the Night's Watch and of the North. The Tale of the Night's King. According to legend, the Night King was the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, who famously enslaved his fellow brothers of the Night's Watch using some form of dark sorcery. According to the legend, the Night's King lived during the Age of Heroes, not long after the Wall was built, and given that he was only the 13th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, it's pretty safe to say that the Wall was definitely still in its infancy at the time of his reign. One night, it is said that he glimpsed a beautiful woman from atop the wall, with pale skin, cold as ice, and eyes like blue stars. And he chased her, caught her, and loved her. And it is said that when he gave her his seed, he gave her his soul as well. He then brought her back to the night fort and proclaimed himself Night's King and her his queen. And together, the two ruled for 13 years, during which they enslaved the fellow members of the Night's Watch, committing countless horrific atrocities. It wasn't until years later when Brandon the Breaker, the current King of Winter at the time, and Jormin, the King Beyond the Wall, joined forces and were able to bring down the Night's King. After which, it was discovered that the Night's King was making sacrifices to the others, and ever since then, all records of his real name have been wiped from history. Now, there are a lot of legends as to who the Night's King could have been, and we hear one such tale from Old Man during A Game of Thrones, in which she says, Some say he was a Bolton. Old Nan would always end. Some say a Magnar out of Skagos. Some say an Umber, a Flint, or Nori. Some would have you think he was a Woodfoot from them who ruled Bear Island before the Ironborn came. He never was. He was a Stark, the brother of the man who brought him down. She always pinched Bran on the cheek then. He would never forget it. He was a Stark of Winterfell. And who could say? Mayhaps his name was Brandon. Mayhaps he slept in this very bed, in this very room. Then, centuries later, came Aegon's Conquest. And the North had been one of the only kingdoms that Aegon had been yet to conquer. King Torrhen Stark, who was the current King of Winter at the time, called his banners and raised 30,000 Northmen and began to march south. But unbeknownst to Torrhen and the Northern Army, King Aegon had already been made aware of their movements. So when Torrhen Stark eventually crossed the Neck and reached the Riverlands, he was met by Aegon I's hosts of 45,000 strong and all three of his dragons flying overhead. Even in the face of all of these odds, some of the northern lords wanted to attack anyway, trusting that northern valor would carry the day. But Torn Stark had already heard about what happened on both the Field of Fire and at Harrenhal. First, where Aegon unleashed all three of his dragons for the first and only time during the war on the combined forces of House Lannister and House Gardner, destroying a force of almost 75,000 strong. Then, later on at Harrenhal, which was the strongest and sturdiest castle that had ever been built in the history of Westeros, at least until Aegon the Conqueror and Balerion the Black Dread descended upon it in the dead of night, reducing it to absolute rubble, killing both Harren the Black and all of his sons in the process. Torrhen Stark was not so eager to see his 30,000 Northmen burn and added to that list. So after nights of negotiation, with letters being sent back and forth between Aegon and Torin, Torin eventually emerged from his tent and crossed the neck himself, and he laid his ancient crown of the Kings of Winter at the feet of Aegon the Conqueror and officially bent the knee, after which he became the first ever Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North, and would forever become known as the King Who Knelt. From that day forward, the Starks were no longer kings of winter, but they were still in charge of guarding and protecting the North as its new wardens. 
the stocks would remain largely away from court politics over the next century or so, remaining mostly to themselves, staying neutral during both the rule of Magor the Cruel and during the uprising of the faith of the militant. Then, later on, in 58 AC, Queen Alisane Targaryen visited Winterfell and was received by Lord Alaric Stark, Warden of the North at the time. And it was said at first that Alaric Stark wasn't too fond of Queen Alysanne, but eventually she managed to charm a reluctant Alaric into granting the lands of the gift to the Night's Watch. Then, Alaric Stark was eventually succeeded by Edric Stark, who was then eventually succeeded by Ellard Stark, who took place in the Great Council of 101 AC to determine who would inherit the Iron Throne after King Jaehaerys I. Later on, Ellard Stark was succeeded by Benjen Stark, who was then succeeded by Rickon Stark, who ruled as Warden of the North until 121 AC. He was then succeeded by his 13-year-old son, Cregan Stark, who would become known as the Wolf of the North, and would go on to be one of the most famous and celebrated Starks in history. Since Cregan was only 13 at the time, his uncle, Bernard Stark, ruled as Lord of Winterfell until Cregan would come of age. But years later, when Cregan would eventually become old enough to inherit the lordship of Winterfell, his uncle Bernard was a little reluctant to hand over power, which led to a power struggle between the two. Now, we don't know the exact nature behind the struggle between the two. What we do know is that eventually Cregan Stark would emerge victorious, having imprisoned both his uncle Bernard Stark and his three sons, and would officially become the sole Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. Then, a few years later in 129 AC, the Dance of the Dragons would officially begin, a savage civil war between two rival factions of House Targaryen that were both vying for the Iron Throne. On one side, you had the Blacks, who were led by Queen Rhaenyra and her husband, Daemon Targaryen. And on the other side, you had the Greens, who were led by King Aegon II and Queen Alicent Hightower. In an effort to secure House Stark as an ally in the war, Rhaenyra would send her eldest son, Jacarys Velaryon, to Winterfell to treat with Cregan Stark, the Wolf of the North. And reports would claim that the two became fast friends, with Jacarys reminding Cregan of his late younger brother who had passed earlier. The two would go on to form an oath of brotherhood accordingly, and they would eventually go on to form something that became known as the Pact of Ice and Fire, the ultimate alliance between House Stark and House Targaryen, that states that Jacarys Velaryon's firstborn daughter would marry Cregan's firstborn son when the two became of age. While Cregan remained up north calling his banners, he sent a small northern splinter force known as the Winter Wolves, led by Roderick Dustin, to aid the Blacks in the fights against the Greens. Since the north was very remote, it took a long time for Cregan to gather the full strength of the northern army, during which most of the fighting would have already taken place. By the time Cregan does eventually make it south to King's Landing with the Great Northern Army, the war was all but over. After the Dance of the Dragons had left most of Westeros in disarray, it then fell to Cregan to pick up the broken pieces and put them back together, during a period of time that would become known as the Hour of the Wolf. Cregan took control of King's Landing during this time, during which he personally dispensed justice to over 20 different enemy combatants with his ancestral Valerian steel sword, Ice. The ancient ancestral sword of House Stark that has been passed down from the Kings of Winter over the centuries. The very next day, Cregan Stark departed King's Landing and headed back north to Winterfell to resume his tenure as Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. A few years later, in 132 AC, a deadly plague known as the Winter Fever broke out with the North being one of the first regions to be struck by the disease, which continued well into 133 AC. With the North in a weakened state from the plague, a large wilding army of over 3,000 strong, led by Silas the Grim, breached the wall and began raiding the lands south of the wall. 
Cregan had to gather what remained of the Northern Army with help of what was left of the Night's Watch and rode out to put an end to Silas and his raiding parties. Years later, Cregan's firstborn son would die during one of the final battles of the conquest of Dorne under King Daron I Targaryen, which the North would later come to lament as each reign after Cregan was a little bit more troublesome than the last. The exact date of Cregan's death is unknown, however, though it is thought that he lived to be quite old as one of his nicknames was famously the Old Man of the North. Some rumors even state that he lived all the way up until the time of the first Blackfire Rebellion, although that is highly unlikely as that would have made him almost 90 years old at the time as the first Blackfire Rebellion took place in 196 AC. Either way, Cregan Stark remains one of the most famous Starks in history and one of the heavy fan favorites. The decades after Cregan's death, however, weren't the best in the history of the North, as many of his descendants would squabble among themselves for succession. Cregan fathered five sons during his lifetime, with his eldest, Rickon Stark, dying before Cregan. After Rickon came Jommel, Edric, Bartholgan, and Brandon. Rickon Stark was survived, however, by his two daughters, Sansa and and Serena Stark, although neither of which were ever mentioned in the succession. Cregan's son Jommel would become the next Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. Jommel went on to marry Sansa, but the two never conceived any children, so upon Jommel's death the lordship should have passed to Edric Stark and then his children after him. But, for some reason that is still unknown to the history books, Cregan's fourth son, Barthogan, inherited Winterfell next. Then, after Barthogan died childless in the Skagosi Rebellion under the reign of King Daron II, he was then succeeded by Cregan's fifth and final son, Brandon Stark, from whom later generations of Starks would descend from. Brandon was succeeded by his eldest son, Rodwell Stark, who was then succeeded by his younger brother, Baron Stark, who ended up getting mortally wounded during an invasion from the Ironborn, led by Dagon Greyjoy. Baron was then succeeded by his son, Donner Stark, who was then followed by his son, Willem Stark. Then, in 226 AC, Raymond Redbeard, the king beyond the wall at the time, would lead a wildling invasion of the North. Willem himself was killed during the fighting by Redbeard himself, but was later revenged by his younger brother, Ardos, who killed the king beyond the wall. After that, Willem was then succeeded by his eldest son, Edwile Stark, who was then succeeded by Rickard Stark, who would end up being the father of Ned, Brandon, Benjen, and Lyanna Stark. After the daughter of Rickard, Lyanna Stark, was kidnapped by the crown prince Rhaegar Targaryen, it prompted Rickard to go to King's Landing with his eldest son Brandon to demand that the king return his daughter at once. Instead, the Mad King burned Rickard alive as he tied his eldest son Brandon to a strangulation device and left a sword just out of reach so Brandon would strangle himself to death trying to free his burning father. After the death of Brandon and Rickard Stark, Ned Stark became the next Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North, and together with his longtime childhood friend Robert Baratheon, who was betrothed to Lyanna Stark at the time, rose up in rebellion and defeated the Targaryen dynasty in what would later become known as Robert's Rebellion. After the war, Ned would return home to Winterfell to resume his duties as Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. He would then go on to have five children of his own in Rob Stark, Bran Stark, Rickon Stark, Sansa, and Arya, along with a bastard son that he brought back from the war by the name of Jon Snow, although it is heavily implied that Jon isn't actually the son of Ned Stark, but rather the son of Ned's sister, Lyanna Stark, and Rhaegar Targaryen. But that's a story for another time. Ned Stark himself would go on to become known as a very just and fair Warden of the North for many years to come, being much beloved by all of his subjects.
Then, in 299 AC, Ned Stark was falsely accused of treason by the false king Joffrey Baratheon, who was secretly the son of Jaime Lannister and Cersei Lannister, and wasn't actually Robert Baratheon's son at all. And once Ned learned of this information, he was quickly put to death by the Lannisters. After which, Ned's eldest son, Rob Stark, would become the next Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North. And Rob wasted no time at all in calling all of his banners and marching a great northern army south to meet the Lannisters in combat in the hopes of freeing his captured sisters who at the time were still captured by the Lannisters. And it was at this time, after Rob had won battle after battle against the Lannister forces, that Rob's men declared the North an independent kingdom once again, and they named Rob Stark the first ever King of the North since the time of Aegon the Conqueror and Torrin Stark, the king who knelt. But unfortunately, it was not long-lived, as not long after that, Rob Stark would end up being betrayed and killed by one of his own men, Roose Bolton. Now, the succession is a little unclear after here. There are some cases that say that Rob named Jon Snow as his next heir, so if that succession is to be honored, it looks like Jon Snow would be the next Lord of Winterfell and Warden of the North especially as most of the North believe that Bran and Rickon Stark are both dead. But it looks like we are going to have to wait until Winds of Winter comes out before we get some more definitive answers as to what is going to happen to the future of House Stark, or will there even be a House Stark by the time this is all said and done. We know that the dreaded Long Night is fast approaching in the books, and it is going to be much, much worse than it was on the show. So I cannot wait for Winds of Winter to hit shelves and us to dive into everything that we've been waiting for. But that is going to do it for us today on the history, lore, and origin on everyone's favorite northern house, House Stark. Be sure to leave a like on your way out, subscribe, and hit that bell for notifications if you haven't already, as we will be doing tons of House of the Dragon and A Song of Ice and Fire related content on the channel. And as always, I want to thank everybody out there for watching, and we will see you on the next one.